We are happy, we are all happy, we are all honored to welcome Professor Dean Ornish as a speaker today. Professor Ornish has been the founder and the president of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute, and he is a professor of clinical medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. He has been educated as an internal medical doctor at the Baylor College, and he has been educated in Harvard and at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And he's a graduate from the University of Texas at Austin, where he graduated with summa cum laude. Since what he said, 36 years, Professor Arnish has been devoted to the question of how comprehensive lifestyle changes would actually not only attenuate, but also reverse chronic disease. So he was the first one to show in a randomized control trial that comprehensive lifestyle changes actually reverse early stage prostate cancer. He was the first one to show that comprehensive lifestyle changes reverse coronary heart disease. And lately, he has been looking at comprehensive lifestyle changes and gene expression, showing that Comprehensive lifestyle changes actually turn off the disease-promoting genes and turn on the disease-preventing genes. Now, Professor Arnish is published in first-tier journals like, like the Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the Medical Association, um, the, the American Medical Association. So, first-tier scientists but he succeeded in doing something which 99.9% .9 of scientists don't succeed in, namely disseminate his ideas across people. He has been writing six bestseller books, um, and they are on the New York bestseller list, and they have such provocative titles such as Eat More and Weigh Less, or Love and Survival. Now, at the end, let me tell you something about Professor Ornish, which is really outstanding, which is that he has fascinated the most fascinating people of our generation, among them Bill Clinton and Steve Jobs. Now, what is so fascinating in Professor Dean Ornish? DLD made it possible that we can experience that now in the next 25 minutes, experience the fascination of Professor Dean Ornish. Welcome. Thank you, Gabrielle. Well, thank you, Gabrielle, for that kind introduction, and to Steffi, and also to uh, Yossi, and to Hubert, and everyone else who made it possible for us to be here today. I want to take this time to talk about the power of lifestyle changes, social networks, and trust. But if you have to boil it all down to one idea, it's a very simple one. It's a radical one, really radical in the sense of getting to the root of something. And that is a simple but very powerful question that's really been a guiding principle for me in all of my work, which is, what is the cause? What's really causing this? You know, we, we spend so much time in medicine mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing without also turning off the faucet. And if you don't treat the cause, then the same problem comes back again. It's like when you get put on blood pressure pills or cholesterol-lowering drugs. You say, how long do I have to take these? And the doctor says, forever. It's like, well, how long do I have to keep mopping up the floor? Well, forever, but, but why don't we just turn off the faucet? And when we do that, what we find is that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized, if we treat the cause. And the causes, for, for the most part, are the simple lifestyle changes that we make each day. What we eat, and I think to the degree we can move towards a, a plant-based whole foods diet, rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and so on. Uh, stress management techniques, often things from like yoga and meditation, moderate exercise, simple things like walking, and perhaps most important, a powerful sense of love and community and social support and intimacy. And it's amazing how quickly these things happen. In our research, we've been using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific diagnostic measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost and often ancient interventions can be. And it's not just lifestyle as prevention, although it, it is, it's also lifestyle as treatment. And all these things were thought impossible, and that's part of the value of science, is to create new hope and new choices and new possibilities for people. 
So as Gabrielle indicated, uh, we're, we started with heart disease, and we did a series of studies beginning in 1977, culminating in the most definitive called the Lifestyle Heart Trial. And we used quantitative arteriography, which is like an x-ray movie of the arteries in your heart, which is shown in the upper left. You can see there's a narrowing there. A year later in the upper right, it's not as clogged. The artery actually, instead of getting more clogged, got less clogged. And because the blood flow is a fourth power function of the diameter, it's exponential, even modest changes in the blockages cause really huge changes and improvements in blood flow, which you can measure, in this case, using cardiac PET scans. And the lower left, where it's blue and black, is a large part of the heart that's not getting any blood flow. And in the lower right, just a year later, it's virtually normal. When we looked at all the arteries and all the patients, they got worse after one year and even worse after five years in the comparison group that wasn't making these changes. But instead of getting worse and worse, which is what usually happens to people with heart disease, they got better and better. They showed some reversal after one year and even more after five years. Now, I'm gonna, just to put a human face on this, I'm gonna show you a short excerpt from a film called Escape Fire. Uh, it's a documentary film. It's downloadable on iTunes and uh, on uh, Netflix. Uh, just, this is a guy named Mel Leffer who 25 years ago entered our study and he was so sick that he literally couldn't walk across the street without getting severe chest pain. He couldn't have sex. It took him an hour to, to take a shower. He was popping nitros, you know, many times a day, 20, 30 times a day. And then within the first month he became pain-free and has remained now pain-free for 25 years. This is not our best case. This is representative of what happens when you treat the cause. So let me just, it's about a minute long. 25 years ago. Can we have I some audio, restaurants in San Francisco. I'm going to just start that again. 25 years ago. Louder, I five please. restaurants in San Francisco. It was a great life. I smoked six cigars a day, uh, 10 cups of coffee, a lot of wine. It was wonderful. And I had a massive heart attack. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I could hardly uh, just about walk three steps and I'd have to stop and rest. I was popping 20 or 30 nitros a day. But then Dean Ornish was starting his program to see if you can reverse heart disease through lifestyle change. And he went to my doctor and asked if he could approach me. He told Dean, how long is the program? So he said it was a year. And my doctor told him uh, he wouldn't recommend taking me because he didn't think I would live the year. So he figured I was gonna die because I was in such bad shape. And now, 25 years later, and I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> his his uh, doctor, on the other hand, unfortunately died in the meantime, but um, the patient's doing well. One of the interesting findings that we learned, which surprised me, was that the more people changed, the better they got at any age. I thought the younger people who had milder disease would do better, but I was wrong. And that's a very hopeful message, that the more you change, the more you improve, and I'll come back to that. So then, as Gabrielle mentioned, we also then looked at prostate cancer, and we took men who had biopsy-proven prostate cancer who had not been treated conventionally, randomly divided them into two groups. We did the study in collaboration with the chairman of urology at UCSF and also the chair at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And we found that the PSA levels went down or got better in the group that made these changes, went up in the control group, in direct proportion to the degree of lifestyle change. The more people change their lifestyle, the lower their PSA. PSA is a marker for prostate cancer activity. We then looked at the effects on tumor growth in vitro, and we found that the tumor growth was inhibited 70% in the group that made these changes, but only 9% in the control group. And in one of the coolest slides, the more people change their diet and lifestyle, the more it directly inhibited the growth of their prostate cancer. We also used a new te technology called MR spectroscopy, which measures the tumor activity shown in red, and you can see that it's shrinking over time, as well as the PSA coming down. So this is now showing, taken as a whole, that the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer can be slowed, stopped, or even reversed simply by changing diet and lifestyle. So we wondered what some of the genetic mechanisms might be to account for that, and so we looked at their gene expression, and we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months, and in every case in a good direction, turning on or upregulating the good genes that prevent disease, 
turning off or down-regulating the genes, particularly the ones that cause prostate cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer. Uh, these are called RAS oncogenes, and if you look at uh, what's called a heat map, red is turned on, green is turned off, and you can see how they go from mostly turned on to mostly turned off. Each one of those things along the right side is an oncogene. We then looked at their telomeres, and we did this in collaboration with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize in Medicine three years ago, for discovering telomerase, which is an enzyme that makes our telomeres longer. Now, telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes that control how long we live. So as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. And a number of things like chronic stress have been shown to shorten telomeres. So we wondered maybe if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things make them longer. And we found sure enough that telomerase was increased by 30% in just three months. It's still the only intervention that's been shown to do this. If this were a new drug, it'd be a billion dollar drug overnight, but it's just the same lifestyle changes for all of these things. It's not like there's one set of lifestyle changes for reversing prostate cancer, another one for heart disease, another one for your genes, another one for your telomeres. It's the same for all of these. The more we look, the more we find mechanisms to explain why these simple changes are so powerful. And we found here again, the more people change their lifestyle, the longer their telomeres got, which I think is very encouraging. And so our genes are not our fate. And that's a powerful message as well. Because so often people think, oh, I've just got bad genes, what can I do? What I call genetic nihilism. In fact, even President Clinton, after his uh, bypass clogged up, was told by his, one of his doctors that it's all in your genes, your diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And I, I wrote him an email and I said, you know, not to blame but to empower, your diet and lifestyle had everything to do with it because otherwise you're just a victim. What can you do if you've just got bad genes? And, and so he began making these changes a couple of years ago, which I think sets a great example for anyone, whatever your politics are. It's a very empowering, very hopeful message that we can actually change our gene expression. I thought it might be worth taking a minute to talk about what we've learned and what enables people to make sustainable changes in diet and lifestyle. And it's not what I thought when I first started. I used to think it was to try to scare people, but it's really about fun and freedom and pleasure and love. If it feels good, you're going to keep doing it. If it's fear-based, you're probably not. And the whole concept of risk factor reduction, you know, get your cholesterol down so you don't get a heart attack, you know, quit smoking so you don't get lung cancer, it's fear-based. And fear is not a sustainable motivator in anything, but particularly in the case of heart disease because you know, we're all going to die. I don't want to be the first person to break the, the news to you, but the mortality rate is still 100%. It's one per person. And so I've just found that efforts to try to motivate people to change out of fear are not sustainable because it's too scary to think about. Maybe for a, a month after you've had something really bad happen to you, you'll do pretty much anything. But even then, people tend to go back to their old patterns. Uh, and this goes back to the first dietary intervention, which failed when God said, don't eat the apple, and that didn't work, so we're not going to do better than that. And if you tell teenagers that smoking is dangerous to try to get fear uh, to keep them from smoking, not only is it not helpful, it's actually counterproductive. You know, like James Dean on a Harley, it just makes it cool. And so fear-based approaches don't work for very long, and in, in many cases, they're counterproductive. The fortune teller says, I give smokers a discount because there's not as much to tell, which is the fear-based approach that doesn't work. And many people think, and many doctors especially, think that taking a pill is easy and everybody will do it, but changing diet and lifestyle is difficult if not impossible and hardly anyone will do it. But the data show just the opposite. You know, the adherence to statin drugs like Lipitor and Zocor and Mevacor and so on is only about 30% at three months. Only 30% of the people who are prescribed them are taking them, even if someone else is paying for them, even if they don't have side effects, even though they're of proven value. And the reason is, is because they don't make you feel better, but you're saying, take this pill today to prevent something really awful like a heart attack or stroke years down the road that you don't want to think about, so you don't, and so you stop taking it. But the, the paradox is that we found that we're getting 85 to 90% adherence to a much more intensive lifestyle program after a year because most people find that they feel so much better so quickly it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy of living, which is. Now, there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy unless you get something back that's better and quickly. And it turns out that these biological mechanisms are so much more dynamic than we had once realized that people really do feel so much better. And it comes out of their own experience, not because some doctor or some book said it. It's like, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So maybe I'll do more of this and less of that. And then it really becomes sustainable. So when you eat healthier, when you manage stress, when you exercise a little bit, when you have more love and intimacy in your life, your brain gets more blood flow, twice as much blood flow, especially to areas like the hippocampus that control memory. 
uh, you can actually grow so many new brain neurons that your brain can get measurably bigger in just three months. That was thought impossible just a few years ago. One, a couple of studies show that just walking for a half hour a day caused so many new brain cells to grow that people's brains got bigger. That's an exciting thing because, you know, when I was in, in medical school, we were taught that if you went out and had a couple of drinks or a six pack, you know, you lose a few thousand neurons, you never get them back. Fortunately, that's not the case. Even your brain, especially your brain, is more dynamic. And it turns out that some of my favorite substances promote neurogenesis, which gets us away from austerity and deprivation and more into the sense of abundance. Things like chocolate and tea and blueberries promote neurogenesis. On the other hand, what's bad for your heart is also bad for your brain. Things like saturated fat and nicotine and sugar are decreased neurogenesis. Moderate alcohol consumption actually increases, but too much kills too many brain cells. Stress management and moderate exercise increase it. And believe it or not, cannabinoids found in marijuana actually increase neurogenesis. I'm, I'm just the messenger here. Uh, <laughs> and sex increases neurogenesis. So um, that'll be uh, your prescription for the next few days. Now, it turns out that smoking, if you tell people that smoking is bad for you, if you see those uh, warnings on the sides of cigarettes in the UK, for example, that you know, smoking, they, they really just try to scare you into not smoking, they don't work. But if you tell somebody that smoking makes you ugly and makes you age 10 or 20 years faster, it takes it out of the future, something bad may happen, the fear-based approach, and puts it right into the here and now. And Chrissy Turlington, the uh, supermodel, her father died of lung cancer. She has a wonderful website called smokingisugly.com because nicotine constricts your arteries. So in your heart, it can lead to a heart attack. In your brain, it can lead to a stroke. But in your face, it constricts the little capillaries that make you uh, wrinkle. So you wrinkle and you have that kind of great pallor. The other thing that people don't realize is that half of guys who smoke are impotent. Seven times more than those who don't. Half. So this idea that smoking makes you sexy and beautiful, it really makes you ugly and impotent, has a very different message. <laughs> Seriously, because it puts it right into the here and now. And one of the most effective anti-smoking ads was done by the Department of Health Services in California, and they had these big billboards with a guy dressed up like a Marlboro man. <laughs> it doesn't say emphysema, heart attack, lung cancer, it says impotence, because you know, you notice the limp cigarette here, uh, because it puts it right into the here and now. And then that's something that makes it work, because it's not fear-based. And the problem with diets are the same thing. It's all about what you can't have and what you must do. And if you go on a diet, chances are you're going to go off a diet fairly soon. You know, that's just because that's the nature of diets. And then you feel that shame and guilt and anger and humiliation that comes from failing at something. It makes you just want to, like, finish the pint of ice cream at that point. You know, the whole language of behavioral change has this kind of moralistic quality. And so what we came up with is an idea called a spectrum, which is not a diet, it's just a way of eating and living. And it's based on our finding that the more you change, the more you improve. And the more you improve, the better you feel. And the better you feel, the more you want to keep doing it. So let's say you want to get your, your cholesterol level down 50 points, or lose 10 pounds, or get your blood pressure down, or your blood sugar, whatever it is. And so I categorize foods from the most helpful to the least helpful and say, where are you on this spectrum? Start there, and to the degree you move in a healthy direction, there's a corresponding benefit. And after a few weeks, if that's enough to accomplish your goals, great. If not, you can do more. It's radically simple in that way. Uh, because again, the primary determinant was the degree of change. The more you change, the more you improve. Now, I chaired Google's health advisory board for, for a few years, and I had access to a lot of really smart Google engineers. And so I, I worked with them for a while to come up with a personalized approach that was, you know, you plug in your DNA testing from 23andMe and your batteries of health risk assessment questionnaires and all this stuff. And one day I thought, you know, I'm just going about this in completely the wrong way. I, I don't know if you ever have those moments of insight where you just go, this is not working. And I thought, instead of making it so complex, let's make it radically simple. Because as soon as I tell you what to do, you, there's immediate pushback. So instead of me telling you what you should be doing, you tell me how much you want to change, how quickly, how many things, and we'll support that degree of change. And then we'll track it. And if that degree of change is enough, great. If not, you can do more. It's radically simple in that way. And if you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you failed or you cheated or all these moralistic words, just eat healthier the next. If you don't have time to exercise one day, do a little more the next. If you don't have time to meditate for 20 minutes, do it for one minute. I mean, you get the idea. And then it comes out of your experience, and so there's no pushback because no one's telling you what to do. One of the other things I've gotten really passionate about is this, what I call a globalization of chronic disease. As other countries are starting to eat like us and live like us and all too often die like us, 
And the supreme irony in all of this is that the diet that we found that can reverse heart disease and cancer and all these wonderful things is basically the diet they were eating before they started to copy our way of eating. And what's happening is it's diverting a lot of precious resources away from things that really do require drugs, like AIDS, TB, and malaria, to things that can be largely prevented or reversed by changing diet and lifestyle. More people are dying today in almost every country in the world, including most of Africa, from heart disease and type 2 diabetes than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And so there's a lot of resources that are getting diverted that can be used for what they're most usable for. And it turns out that what's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. What's good for you is good for the planet. And there are three major crises that we all deal with every day. You know, the global warming crisis, the energy crisis, and the healthcare crisis. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I just feel like it's overwhelming. What can one person do, right? Well, it turns out that something as simple as the lifestyle choices that we make each day, what we eat, for example, has an impact on all three of these. And when something is meaningful, then it becomes sustainable. Let's start with the global warming crisis. Many people are surprised to hear that uh, livestock, causes, livestock consumption causes more global warming than all forms of transportation combined. You know, 18% uh, versus 13% for the entire global transportation system. So maybe you don't want to be a vegetarian, maybe you just have a meatless Monday. But you know, just a little change can go a long way in terms of creating a sense of that you can actually do something about it and it's meaningful. The cartoon says, my only consolation is that by eating us, they're killing themselves. I like this cartoon. <laughs> the energy crisis, it turns out that 20% of the fossil fuel that we burn goes to processed foods, which not only makes them unhealthy, but it takes a huge energy expenditure. And if you eat higher in the food chain, if you're eating a lot of meat, for example, it takes 10 times more resources for an equivalent amount of protein than if you get it from fruits and vegetables and grains and beans and so on. From an energy crisis, Michael Pollan calculated that a, a quarter pounder with cheese takes 26 ounces of petroleum, leaves a 13 pound carbon footprint, which is equivalent to burning seven pounds of coal. Just one burger. So again, little changes in your diet make a big difference in the environment. From the health crisis, it turns out that three quarters of the $2.8 trillion in healthcare costs, which are really sick care costs, are for chronic diseases, which we can largely prevent and even reverse through changing diet and lifestyle. And as you know, there's this raging debate going on now in Washington between many Republicans who say, let's just privatize or dismantle Medicare. Many Democrats saying, let's just raise taxes, let the deficit go up. Not a lot of overlap there, and so there's really not much consensus at all. But we're saying, wait a minute, there's a third alternative here. If we can turn off that faucet of that sink that's overflowing, in other words, if we treat the cause, which again are our lifestyle choices, then we can make better care available to more people at lower costs, and the only side effects are good ones. Now, there are lots of studies that support that besides ours. This was a study also uh, in the, one of the AMA's lead journals that found that 23,000 people walking a half hour a day, eating a reasonably healthy diet, keeping a reasonably healthy weight, prevented 93% of type 2 diabetes, 81% of heart disease. Other studies have shown you could prevent probably 95% of heart disease today. We don't need a new breakthrough, we don't need a new laser, a new high-tech device, we just need to put into practice what we've already learned. And we've found that these approaches are not only medically effective, they're also cost-effective. We've done three demonstration projects. The first found that 80% uh, of people who had, were told they needed to have bypass surgery, angioplasty, were able to safely avoid it by simply changing diet and lifestyle. And the insurance company found they saved $30,000 per patient in the first year. Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield found they cut their overall healthcare costs by 50% in the first year. Now, if we're spending $2.8 trillion a year, and we could cut that in half in the first year, that frees up a whole lot of resources that we could use for other things. And then two years ago, Medicare agreed after 16 years of review to cover our program. They even called it a, a Dean Ornish program, which they've never done before because they're so concerned about quality assurance and so on. So now through our nonprofit institute, we've been training hospitals and clinics around the country in, in creating a new paradigm of true health care rather than simply sick, sick care. And if you're interested about learning more about this or the other work we're doing, uh, just go to our Ornish.com site. One of the sites that we train is the St. Vincent de Paul Homeless Shelter in San Francisco. That was about two years ago. They've seen over 20,000 patients, homeless people, through the clinic. So if homeless people can make these changes, I think anybody can. And the Medicare coverage now is covering the overall costs of the clinic, and so it, it doesn't now require ongoing philanthropy. And so we'll be scaling that throughout St. Vincent de Paul Homeless Shelters throughout the U.S. and ultimately throughout the world, which I, I, I find personally very meaningful. 
The last thing I want to talk about is perhaps the most important, and that is that the real epidemic isn't just heart disease or cancer or obesity, it's loneliness and depression and isolation. You know, it turns out that people who are lonely and depressed are three to ten times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community, in part because you're more likely to abuse yourself. And people say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends, what are you going to give me? Or food fills the void or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain. So information is not enough and changing behavior is not enough, we have to work at a deeper level, and I think Gabrielle will talk some more about that as well. We found that we cut depression scores in half when we give people a sense of community. And so, one study, for example, showed that people who were depressed after a heart attack were four times more likely to be dead after six months than those who aren't. Uh, it turns out there's an epi epidemic of, uh, of homeless, I mean, of uh, depression in veterans, that 18 veterans a day kill themselves, and one active duty soldier a day kills themselves, more than died in Iraq or, or Afghanistan in combat. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, the more people felt loved and supported, and oh, by the way, I wanted to show you a, uh, a short video clip from uh, General Stan McChrystal, a four-star general under, uh, uh, who was uh, unfortunately fired by President Obama when he made intemperate remarks in Rolling Stone. But I asked him to make a video that I ended up short showing at the Army War College about the power of love, which I thought was nice. I'm going to share it with you here real quick. Dear, this is Stan McChrystal. Thanks for letting me be a part of your presentation today on the power of love. It's not something you'd normally hear in a military gathering, but I don't think it's inappropriate. I go back to my early days in my career, and I think all of us experienced this. There were leaders who would use negative or coercive leadership, sometimes through fear or intimidation, to try to, to try to get us to do whatever it is they wanted us to do. What I found through experience, and it was first taught to me by Major General Bill Garrison, was that no matter how much fear we create in subordinates, that's just not strong enough to force them into actions when they're more scared of something else, particularly a situation like combat. When the chance of being injured or killed by the enemy is great, any fear they have of their chain of command is likely to, to be very insignificant. What we find, of course, is that in the end, soldiers react to what they feel strongly about. They react to positive leadership, they react to positive values, they react to a positive environment created around them, and they react to a positive example from leaders that they respect and leaders they care deeply about. In a sense, soldiers do what they feel strongly about, and it really gives to the idea it's the power of the positive aspect. It's they do what they want to do, not what they're scared to do. So I think the power of love is appropriate. Thanks, Steve. All the best. The last thing I want to mention is that um, when you're depressed, your immune system is depressed in all the ways we can measure. One study showed, for example, that men and women who are HIV positive had more than double the likelihood of developing AIDS and dying from it than those who weren't. But support groups, intimacy is healing. Uh, one study with women with metastatic breast cancer from Stanford found that those who had a support group once a week for a year, five years later, lived twice as long independent of other factors. And it wasn't just a support group, it was the way that we do our support groups. It's more of an intentional community, a place where people feel safe enough to let down their emotional defenses and, and, and uh, open up. You know, David Christakis' work found that if your friends are obese, your risk of obesity is 45% higher. If your friend's friends are obese, it's 25% higher. And if your friend's friend's friends are obese, it's 10% higher, even if you've never met them. That's how powerful these social networks are. It's also seen with lots of other things as well. And it doesn't matter if you see the person face-to-face in, in -face, or you do it online or you do it on the phone. It's all about connection and community. And so all of you who are doing work that's bringing us together in these brilliant presentations we've been hearing, really you're not just monetizing things and not just making it fun for people, it's really healing in the root of, you know, to heal is to make whole. You know, yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are very old ideas that we're rediscovering. And so anything that creates that sense of trust can lead to intimacy and meaning. And if you have intimacy and meaning, then it's healing. 
Because you can only be intimate to the degree you can be vulnerable. You know, you let your emotional defenses down, you open your heart to someone. And that's what we used to have with neighborhoods that had two or three generations of people, or a, a, a job that felt secure that people would work at for decades, or a church or synagogue, or an extended family that people would see. And many people don't even have any of those things. And we, know that, we all know that those things affect the quality of our lives, but they actually affect our survival to a much larger degree than we had realized. And all these uh, spiritual truths, the so-called perennial philosophy of Aldous Huxley that you find in virtually all religions and all spiritual traditions once you get past the, the rituals that people, you know, kill themselves over, there are things like altruism, compassion, forgiveness, and love. And the reason is, is that's what frees us from our suffering. That's what frees us from our isolation. And I'm just going to end with a quick story. In the very first study that I did when I was uh, uh, a second-year medical student 36 years ago in 1977, I had a group of men and women with heart disease put them in a hotel for a month. And one of the guys was an older uh, dentist who hated gay people, and one of the other men was gay. And they started, they went at it, and one yelled at them, got chest pain, took a nitro. The other yelled at him, took a, a Demerol, and slammed the door, slammed the door. I thought, this is going to be the end of my very short research career because they're both going to have heart attacks and die. And I talked to them after they quieted down, and I said, you know, you're giving the power to give you a chest pain and maybe to have a heart attack and die to the person that you hate the most. That's not really smart, even from your own self-interest. And so these spiritual truths, and so I asked them to be more compassionate with each other, not because when you forgive someone, it doesn't condone or excuse what they've done, but it frees you from the suffering and the pain and ultimately the heart disease, which they were able to do. That's what I find most powerful in, about this is, and why I'm so passionate about doing this work. Because, you know, it's nice to unclog arteries and to reverse cancer and things like that, but ultimately we're just forestalling the inevitable. You know, we're all going to die, as I mentioned earlier. I'm much more interested in not how long we live, but how well we live. And when we can work at that level, we can help people use the experience of their suffering, not only their physical suffering, which is easier to measure, but the deeper loneliness and depression and so on, as a catalyst or as a doorway for transforming our lives to the point where patients often say things like, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me, or being diagnosed with cancer. And you want to go, what are you nuts? And they say, that's what it took to get my attention that's enabled me to, to, to change these aspects of my life that have made my life so much more joyful and meaningful, and I can quiet down my mind and experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being. I can be more compassionate with myself. I can be more compassionate with other people. And so even if I knew I wouldn't live a day longer, I'd still keep doing these things because the quality of our lives is so greatly improved. So again, I want to thank you for the chance to be here today. Thank you.